uh, and it, it should be visible now. Uh, this is on the Databricks community environment. Uh, and what I'm doing here, basically, I'm creating super small uh, data frame. Uh, let me uh, actually uh, run this code to show even like without user defined function what it's doing. And the purpose of this short demonstration is just to introduce us to like user defined function and show, okay, we want to use that user defined function in our code. Uh, what is it? Uh, how do I do that? How do I use uh, UDF in my uh, PySpark code? So uh, in here, I'm defining this um, data frame in the data frame API. It contains some name, surname, uh, some dates, um, let's say registration registration dates for our user and it contains null represented by the non in python this is like to maybe uh, to make this uh, this uh, demo a little little bit more interesting and show in addition to just syntax for defining udf some some considerations uh, around how it's handling nulls already and this is yet before uh, udf i have udf commented out so uh, the data frame is here displayed and we can see that we have this null values in uh, various of my records. And uh, if I want to um, use some custom logic, um, I can do something super simple. In this example uh, of concatenation of strings, uh, I would not uh, normally use UDF for this purpose because basically I have uh, just built-in function that is perfect for this solution that is actually uh, already used here in what you see for concatenation. So where the built-in function exists, uh, there is no need. It's uh, We will talk about it more. It's uh, counter uh, counterproductive uh, to, to use UDF and we should avoid that. But in, in here it's to show you more like, uh, like how the syntax works. So let me uncomment this user defined function. And what I'm doing here, uh, you see that I'm defining my own um, Python function, basically. Uh, I have this line that is uh, basically for my, my use case handling the non values. And I'll show you later how it behaves without this line. Uh, and um, this is this is a powerful construct because basically I if I want for my use case I can use any uh, kind of uh, like import Python libraries modules functions and uh, make use of uh, some some purpose built functions for things like uh, go location uh, for uh, things like even handling uh, requests to the API so it's it's a fairly uh, powerful concept that basically uh, lets me lets me um, allows me to um, take uh, take uh, like all these powerful features that are available in Python or maybe not available in Spark uh, out of the box. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm defining this uh, plain and simple Python function in here just for returning concatenation of strings. And I'm registering uh, this uh, Python function. So the effect in Spark is basically that when I'm registering, I, I have imported this UDF uh, from PySpark SQL functions. I'm using this UDF uh, to register my function and it becomes uh, known to, to uh, PySpark application, it's basically sent to all the executors so that uh, we can uh, make, make use of parallel processing. And let me define here data frame three, which will make use now uh, instead of building function concat of this my UDF I have registered here. So we see here that we have like a the, with the naming of function we can use, it's not actual name of the Python function in this case, it's the name under which we have registered our UDF. And let me uh, display that. So uh, now uh, we can see like the result is the same as expected as using this uh, built-in function. 
what uh, may be not expected for the people just starting with Python UDFs is that, uh, you know, in the building functions, we didn't need to like explicitly care about nulls. So basically, if we try concatenate some uh, to nulls or text with the null, then it will basically um, return null value as the result of concatenation. But if I were to remove this um, line, which is basically uh, taking care of this, um, like, explicitly in the Python function, and I'm trying to run it. And you can see that uh, instead of like uh, handling automatically uh, the nulls in some way, I'm just getting the error that it cannot uh, concatenate non-type and string. So this uh, handling of nulls is uh, something that uh, we need to keep in mind for the um, Python UDFs. Uh, and now um, like um, maybe I will show you that there is like even a simpler syntax. So instead of registering this function, I can use use this like UDF annotation. And uh, in here I can also like specify as uh, optional um, the return type for my uh, UDF. And this is like the uh, simpler way and uh, uh, analogical to the um, something with the indentation, uh, analogical to the one that we'll see also for the Panda UDFs that I'll uh, discuss uh, with the um, performance. Uh, name, name, right? Uh, you use registered name, my UDF, and right now you need to use name and yes, yes. The, the, the Python. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dimitro. Uh, yeah, uh, and this is like uh, saving with the um, uh, with the um, like uh, double naming. So for registering uh, my UDF, I, I needed to use the uh, this name under which I have registered. And here it's just uh, the, mm, the single mm, name of the uh, Python uh, function. So uh, this is now uh, just again working uh, the same way as uh, in the um, in the first scenario, uh, and uh, yeah, this is um, this is um, like um, the maybe nicer some some nicer syntax to uh, shorten your code, and uh, we'll we'll see that again uh, in context of the uh, pandas UDF that are um, a response to some of the um, performance uh, considerations with the uh, like. Uh, traditional UDFs. Uh, okay, so with that said, let me uh, switch to my uh, presentation. Uh, and in here, uh, uh, let's maybe first take like a little bit uh, step back. Uh, and uh, I want to start talking like uh, about like what's the analogy between user defined functions. Um, we don't call like if we write our custom logic in language like Python, we don't call it user defined function. But this is the like analogical distinction between uh, defining our own solution versus using something that is available in built-in function in the language on in the library. So normally it's user-defined function is the concept we'll come across in, in uh, context of databases or Spark. But the analogy is also with the programming language where starting a career as a programmer, uh, basically we are uh, aware from the very beginning that uh, where the functionality that we want to use already exists, uh, we it's counterproductive to try to implement it by hand. And, uh, you know, even like a beginner pro programmer would usually not try to write his own sorting algorithm in Python if he is aware that uh, the functionality exists and is available uh, out of the box. So in general sense, we can compare like um, building our using our UDFs in PySpark applications to uh, writing our custom logic uh, as opposed to using um, functionalities that may be available out of the box. But uh, there is analogy and there are differences between because there are some unique characteristics and unique considerations related to the to two facts, I would put it this way, that with Spark SQL, we have this declarative paradigm, like with the SQL programming, that we are not um, like describing the control flow of the program, but rather saying what we want to achieve. And there are some things happening 
happening in the execution engine and the Spark optimizations that uh, contribute basically to um, to the final result. And this uh, adds like additional layer of the complication. And the fact that we are no longer considered with only single machine, but we are executing on the uh, on the cluster of uh, of machines. And this is. Um, like some Python, this is not not PySpark. This is in this case like pure Python example to show you some like like power of using built-in functionalities rather than inventing your own if not necessary. So in here I have defined like naive factorial function. So factorial basically is a mathematical operation that if we have some number we are multiplying all the like consecutive numbers up to the number itself. So like factorial five would be one times two times three times four times uh, five and I, I use factorial because it's like an example of uh, cpu intensive for the large large numbers calculating factorial of large number is an example of cpu intensive uh, operation that can be time consuming and is like a nice example for some uh, optimizations and then uh, i am just what what i'm doing i have a list of numbers and i'm applying um, like, like uh, maybe artificial example but nice to show sometimes differences and i'm applying in python this factorial to each and every uh, number on the on the list uh, and here uh, you can see I have this list uh, of 15,000 numbers. I just generated consecutive number with the range uh, and I'm measuring, this is like a crude way of measuring uh, time of execution in Python. But uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, we are interested like on magnitude of, uh, of order of order of magnitude of the times we need to um, spend in different cases. And if I were to to use this, um, like I, I say, naive factorial that I wrote on my own. So I'm starting with result as one, then um, basically uh, multiplying all the numbers that that are consecutive numbers up to uh, up to the number itself, and uh, that, that's like. Uh, few lines of code and super simple to write but still um, if i were uh, to execute something like that for 50000 uh, 50000 uh, numbers of on my like macbook pro with the intel cpu then it will take like something like uh, 200 seconds uh, well over 3 minutes uh, for uh, for the execution of that and now I have some comparison here. So if I were just to take the smarter algorithm, better algorithm, existing algorithm, the same as is as is in the used in the built-in function, but uh, just put it in Python because building function is the C code and uh, from the uh, building function in, in this case in the math math module. Uh, and uh, if I were just to use the same algorithm but implemented it Python for like more clever version of uh, factorial, then from over three minutes, I will be down to 40 seconds. And if I were to use the building function that is provided out of the box for me in the Python, that it will be down to 28 seconds. And, you know, there is for, for, for this particular example, there is room for further uh, optimizations. It can go down like for f four seconds in my experimentation. Uh, but uh, what I want to show here that uh, in uh, like reasoning about using building function in, in the programming language in Python is rather a simpler uh, case because if someone asks us, okay, so uh, what's the reason behind gaining all the speed improvements? You you went like significantly from over three minutes to uh, less than uh, less than and have the benefit of using a built-in functionality uh, rather than uh, defining your own. And in, in uh, like, I'm not saying that it's always simple and super straightforward, but it's definitely more straightforward than reasoning about the code executing in framework like Spark on the cluster. So I think it, it's often, often, not always, not only, but often boils down to the two um, like main uh, consideration. 
So we have like better algorithm, smarter algorithm, and it may involve like, uh, it's easy to say it's only better algorithm because there's uh, like a lot of reasoning, like what data structures to use and so on. But we have a better algorithm. In this case, it's written in C. So it's like a fairly straightforward reasoning about uh, using a building function in, in Python. And as, as we can uh, import in Python our, in, in PySpark functions, uh, our own libraries and uh, Python functions, it's another point that uh, when we have something available in Python and we are writing uh, our Python, um, our PySpark UDFs, we, we may want to import uh, something that will give us a good performance and solve the problem for us. And now moving uh, to the to the actual subjects, so the Python UDFs. So uh, there are, as we have seen in this like trivial example of just concatenating the string, they will allow us to write our own custom transformations. It can be in Python, it can be in Scala. We will a little bit discuss the differences and use external libraries. So I, if I had a need to use this, for example, factorial uh, calculation for some like uh, maybe, I don't know, um, probability uh, calculation, then uh, this, this I would basically import this in, in for my UDF rather than writing it by hand as, as part of my uh, UDF definition. And um, they can take or return one or more columns. Uh, and uh, we need to register, as we have we seen in this demonstration at the beginning, a custom function with Spark. Uh, and uh, basically, it results in copying them to all the worker machines. So we take uh, advantage of the uh, parallel execution in Spark. And um, basically, Spark uh, takes this function and sends this, uh, send this to uh, executor from the from the driver. Uh, and uh, now the, there is uh, this difference I started with between the situation that we are using Scala and we are uh, using uh, Python processes. So one thing is that uh, Scala has also concept of user-defined aggregate function that is not available in PySpark. Uh, and uh, Spark ver uh, Python version has uh, several limitations. And several limitations as compared to the uh, Scala and Java UDFs and several uh, limitations as compared to uh, obviously uh, native building functions. And uh, now what will happen if we basically uh, create something like the even basic uh, user-defined function as we have seen it in the uh, introductory uh, presentation. So uh, if this function is the Python function, the one thing that will happen is that separate Python process will be started on each worker. Uh, and then uh, what will happen is uh, that obviously the uh, Spark is operating on the JVMs underneath and we'll, need, we'll have this data serialization between the Python process and uh, JVM. Also with this standard UDF, we'll have this user-defined function that is operating row by row. So there is some calculation um, defined or some operation defined on the um, UDF level. And it's basically data sent from the uh, JVM to Python and Python processing it uh, one row at a time and returning to uh, JVM. Uh, and um, this is expensive. This is uh, like a performance bottleneck, performance uh, uh, downgrader. And uh, basically, this is the, the main reason that uh, we should, uh, if possible, think even to like uh, alternatives to using normal Spiral UDFs. And we'll discuss like main alternatives. This is expensive and uh, the, the big cost is, uh, there is some cost in starting the Python process, the big cost is with uh, serializing, the serializing the data. And uh, there is problem that uh, Spark basically cannot manage the memory in the, in the Python process in this case for the UDF. So this is uh, this is like the main uh, consideration here, uh, and we see this exchange between data in, between JVM and Python process. And um, now I want to um, like give some um, context for another problem 
with uh, Spark UDF. Another problem with Spark uh, PySpark uh, Python UDF and and uh, generally uh, UDFs is that they're black box to uh, the optimizer. So let's see how uh, it works with the like uh, structured APIs like data frames, um, how it's uh, organized. Um, so we have uh, we have obviously um, from the beginning of Spark this resilient distributed data sets and they are still used like um, if we are using if we are working with the structured API like data frames uh, this will provide us like table abstractions so we can reason about our calculations about our transformations in the similar way as, as we were in SQL so this is idea behind Spark SQL data frames uh, structured API uh, underneath this will be translated to the RDD operations. This is not like uh, exactly the same as this user facing uh, RDD API, but uh, uh, we can we can think about it as uh, as corresponding to the user facing RDD APIs. And this this underneath operations in RDDs are then not accessible to the programmer. So if we write in in um, data frames and in Spark SQL, then uh, like what um, exactly are these operations are, are uh, created. It's it's like where we kind of lose hands-on control on this more detailed, more, more, more fine-grained uh, execution um, specifics. Uh, and uh, what we see important in the in the central of this uh, of this picture is the optimizer that will basically uh, take our sometimes chains of the transformation, our logic, and um, find a way to optimize it to make it better. Uh, and in here I have this um, basically um, and basically flow of the optimization and coming up with the with the uh, most efficient plan this is already like quite old um, diagram i took it from the uh, from the paper of uh, matei zaharia from 2015 so already some time and already there uh, there should be like some additions um, connected to the some changes in the in the optimization like for example adaptive Query execution in Spark 3.0, but for our purpose here, uh, it's um, it's like I think a good uh, simplified maybe version, um, if even not most up to date, to see about few important steps here that uh, actually we should be like aware of how it works to understand the problems that we can encounter when using something uh, like UDFs uh, that is basically the black box uh, for the Spark. So we see the stage of uh, logical plan and uh, basically logical optimizations. Um, applied here and i'll speak a little bit more about that and then we see the cost based optimization cost model where basically different uh, physical plans that are generated are compared for uh, like which is uh, least cost to be like the winner of the various sometimes more than one um, options that that spark has to uh, execute the the same code so the logical optimization it's like like rule-based optimization applied to the logical plan. And uh, in the physical plan phase, uh, we have sometimes one, one or sometimes more than one physical plans that are being generated uh, using like physical operators uh, matching Spark execution engine. And the plan is executed for select, for, like selected for being executed uh, based on the cost, cost comparison. And um, Basically, what happens when we are putting our logic into UDFs, uh, we can prevent some logical optimization from happening, like uh, predicate pushdown, uh, constant folding, uh, and Spark not be able, as another step, to optimize cost uh, of this uh, UDF. 
So maybe uh, like example with the um, with the predicate push down, we can have this optimization which will basically uh, allow us to um, allow Spark to figure out if our some filtering operation is happening in the like right moment. So if we have like a complicated chain of transformation and at the end we are saying something okay, but filter only for one country, maybe this filtering can happen earlier in the chain of the transformation, maybe even reading uh, data from Parker, for example, there can be already read, which will uh, already apply this filter to read in only the data that, that will be needed, uh, rather than uh, reading a lot of data and then um, basically uh, at the very end of the chain of operations, realizing that, uh, well, but from this very big, uh, big amount of data, we actually want to narrow it down by, by, by some very selective filter. Now, um, this is, uh, this is uh, once again the situation that uh, we have this like uh, nicely laid out plan um, for Spark to reason and to optimize the code that developers express in the declarative manner. But if we are introducing UDFs here, we are introducing black box basically, which is, uh, which is challenging for the uh, optimizations. And um, so UDFs are black box to the optimizer. We can lose some uh, Spark SQL optimization. They work one row at a time, then require a separate Python process to be started and data to be sent between Python processes and JVM. And there is this high overhead of data serialization and deserialization. So as, as we see, uh, as powerful as they are, and we can imagine that it's, it's super nice and super powerful tool to not be limited to the functions that are available in Spark, but basically be able to take any library, any custom logic from Python and express our own um, data transformations with that. As powerful as this is, uh, it's also uh, it's also uh, come coming with many many uh, performance problems. And now uh, there there are maybe like uh, starting with the quick uh, evolution of, of uh, Python UDFs. Uh, so they have been like introduced uh, in Spark 1.2 in 2014. Then uh, in 2017, we gained the possibility to actually run Java UDFs from Python API. Uh, in Python 2.3 in 2018, we uh, gained Panda UDFs and in 3.0, like new, new Panda UDFs, some, some redesigns, some changes here, uh, including uh, usage of the Python type hints. Uh, so this, uh, I would say that this um, actually uh, coming back, uh, like resorting to the Java code, which can be then uh, called from our Python application and uh, using uh, Panda UDFs are two main uh, like um, attempts to mitigate the negative implication of the standard uh, PySpark UDF performance. Uh, and um, so using vectorized pandas UDFs, writing UDFs in Scala or Java and calling it from Python code, this is, these are the like uh, main ways that we can, uh, we can attempt that uh, in optimizing our, uh, our uh, PySpark application that is relying on the UDFs. Uh, and maybe just quickly coming back, we see that it will not, uh, neither of this will be able to take care of the first point that we are uh, having here. So uh, with, with all the like uh, optimizations and uh, benefits that, that they bring us, uh, we'll not be able to resolve the problem that it's still a black box to uh, Spark optimizer. Um, and uh, Panda UDFs, so introducing Panda UDFs, uh, also known as vectorized UDFs, they use uh, Apache Arrow uh, format to transfer data between JVM and Python processes to save time on, on serialization and deserialization. So uh, we can, uh, the similar way as I shown uh, using the annotation uh, for defining the UDFs, instead of UDF, I could have written Pandas UDF and it's as simple as that uh, together with the types definition 
to to be using uh, to be switching from using uh, the traditional UDFs to, to Panda UDFs uh, and uh, basically Apache Arrow being like in memory columnar format uh, that uh, saves uh, us time on serialization and the serialization which is a big uh, bottleneck in running uh, PySpark UDFs uh, it's it's provide basically format that is already consumable to the Python process uh, and uh, another uh, thing so another thing that coming back jumping back uh, problem that it works one row at a time it's it's addressed here as well so instead of operating on in individual input row by the row uh, we can operate on the pandas series uh, or pandas data frames so uh, this is um, first uh, consideration for the uh, for the optimizations and here yes, i have one question absolutely like uh so we are solving everything except the first point if you like using scala or java like from this four yeah or not uh, if we are using uh, Scala or Java, yes, but there will be, I will show some uh, performance uh, like uh, measurements that, that I've been able to find. So uh, there can be, uh, it's, it's not always like, um, for for any use case, it's it's not always universal for any use case. So I will uh, show the the differences for like uh, uh, use cases in the in the rankings in the measurements I find. And there is some penalty for uh, running this Scala or Java uh, UDF from the Python code. So if we want to basically uh, run uh, take take our uh, like uh, keep our PySpark application, have this uh, UDF in Java and Scala and call it from a PySpark application, it will be slower than uh, just native, uh, ca calling it from the native uh, Java or Scala application, according to the some, some uh, performance, uh, performance measurements I've been able to uh, find. Uh, I, I didn't perform, uh, like I didn't uh, uh, do any like performance measurements on my own on that. So I will, I will link, I will point to, to some that I've been able to uh, find. But basically uh, with the Java, as you said, with the Java Java and Scala UDFs, uh, we can have also this user-defined aggregate function in Java and Scala. Uh, we don't uh, require uh, separate Python processes to be uh, started between the two, and we are like saving the serialization and the serialization. With uh, Panda UDFs, it, it's uh, safe, basically it's, uh, because Panda UDFs is not yet Java and Scala, it's, it's still like a Python on the solution so it's it will save us the problem with working on one row at a time and uh, basically the serialization and the serialization uh, and uh, basically there there still be need to run the python python processes and there still be problem with the udfs as a, as a black box um and here, um, actually, this is uh, from I, I took this uh, basic examples uh, from the like for the like plus one uh, application from the Databricks blog where this is not yet using this newer uh, uh, newer syntax for the type hints. So if you define it like in the newest Spark, the way that is shown here, you will get get a warning that this is deprecated syntax, and now the the type hints are are recommended for that with type hints working basically the, the uh, very same way as, as just using it normally in Python. And we have this basic uh, plus one uh, application example. I'm showing just that because it's, it's one showing up also on the some performance measurement I will show later. And uh, we, we see this uh, annotation uh, for like defining UDF and defining Panda UDF. So it's like a clear, clear analogy here and we see that uh, switching from the like traditional UDF to the uh, Panda UDF doesn't need to be like uh, complicated or, or something that will require us to write uh, much more code and, and uh, things like that. Um, 
And basically, uh, this is like example of super uh, simple functions that just takes some value, adds one, and uh, that it, that's it. What it's uh, doing, um, and in here uh, coming coming, this is also from this uh, Databricks blog that uh, has been uh, published already a few years back with the introduction of the uh, Panda UDFs uh, we, into the Spark. Uh, so they they are. Uh, comparing three different three different functions so the first simplest one is uh, the one that is uh, shown uh, before this plus one super simple function and um, other I, i'm also uh, putting links in here so i'll put these links into the um into the like below the presentation when it's uh, when it's published on our community uh, website so that you can you can go into details if you are interested how how it has been measured and for what what are details of the other functions here but they are showing uh, obviously with the with the introduction of new feature this this type of rankings uh, especially from the technology provider like databricks themselves can be uh, made the way to show the the greatest performance gain imaginable uh, but obviously we see that there are use cases that there can they can bring a very big uh, performance gain with basically here these numbers representing time uh, in the seconds so even in, in one of example coming uh, from uh, like almost four minutes uh, to to uh, one second so there are uh, great performance uh, games possible uh, and um, some other uh, rankings I've been I've been able to um, to uh, find on the on the internet one is from uh, the developers team from the ENG bank I think this one uh, that they, they've been basically comparing a Python UDF, a Python vectorized UDF, and the Scala UDF, which uh, still in, in their comparison came out as a clear winner with the much faster execution time than uh, Panda vectorized UDF. Uh, and uh, another, uh, another uh, comparison of the uh, performance here I found. Uh, so this is from uh, Quantum Black developers. Uh, and um, they've been comparing uh, different use cases, uh, basically uh, having some simple functions uh, and having some complex functions and executing uh, in uh, PySpark UDFs, like the traditional one, Pandas UDF, Scala UDF, and uh, for the complex, they, they are showing also comparison for the um, for the complex Scala UDF with Python wrapper, basically called from Python and not from Python. So I think like the interesting thing is in, in their results that uh, it's not always uh, performance gain with the pandas UDF depending on the uh, use case and uh, basically for the simple one uh, th there is like the similar trend as as we've seen in the previous one so basically Python UDF the slowest vectorized panda uh, UDF uh, uh, somewhere in the middle and Scala UDF super fast so we, we can see for the simple UDF the same uh, way that uh, PySpark is the uh, like the traditional is again the slowest than uh, pandas in the middle and uh, Scala um, the winner. Uh, with the complex one, we see that they, they found the, the some use cases that actually pandas UDFs was not uh, faster was significantly slower than the traditional UDF and also the good good thing they are pointing out is that this Python wrapper in this case uh, as opposed to just calling it from the uh, Scala uh, application that's um, that's like uh, much over double a time uh, of the of the execution of the native Scala application in case if we are just uh, calling this uh, UDF from Python. Uh, okay, so I think this is basically all I wanted to uh, show you today. We will move to question, maybe one more uh, thing before uh, we move to questions so I can show you also uh, as uh, maybe closing demonstration. I started with the demonstration so I can also like 
um, finish with the with the one uh, here and uh, basically this is just to show you that also this like defining Scala uh, function um, and using it from PySpark uh, it doesn't have to be like super difficult. In, in my presentation, there are links uh, where there are links to this performance measurements. They are also explaining how to do that in the situation that you are deploying the application rather than um, basically making use of the notebook. So here is the shortcut because uh, I'm, I'm using the notebook, so I, I don't need to spend specify class path and I'm taking the easier way to incorporate in the PySpark application using like SQL expression here and running actually SQL directly from my uh, PySpark application. So uh, taking the shortcuts here, but uh, you, uh, under the links, you can find the uh, examples how to do that in a um, like uh, in, in other scenarios. And I have this like super, uh, super simple uh, Scala UDF uh, against, uh, again, this is like just to uh, show the syntax. We, we would never use the UDF uh, like that where the, where the uh, like uh, th there is just no need to, to resort to UDF. And uh, I have already like registered this uh, UDF. And now, uh, basically, with the with the view uh, based on my uh, very simplistic data frame that is just has two columns with some numbers, I'm running the SQL uh, on that to basically uh, incorporate use this uh, UDF from my SQL, and it it one of the way that we can make use uh, of the um, of the uh, Java or Scala user defined function is just uh, calling them from this uh, UDF um, UDF uh, um, function within the SQL block and uh, we have registered Java function in and uh, register uh, Java uh, user defined aggregate function if we if we uh, want to uh, use it directly from the PySpark with the Java class name that that needs to be uh, provided uh, as uh, as an argument uh, here uh, okay so I think this is um, this is basically everything I have uh, prepared from uh, my end so uh, we have uh, we have uh, some time for the for the question and happy happy to answer your your questions now